Hello and welcome back. It's time now for Business News with William Edwards. Hello to you. Hi, We're going to start in the United States where the plan B for the fiscal cliff has failed. That's right. Now, this was a Republican plan. They hoped to pass a bill through the lower House of Congress, which they control. And, uh, well, Republican leaders thought it looked like a pretty reasonable compromise uh, with President Obama. They knew it wasn't going to get through the upper House of Congress, which the Democrats control. But they say that they were hoping to be able to say that at least they'd done something uh, to avoid the fiscal cliff. However, the plan hasn't quite worked out, as Jocelyn Vardy explains. It was called an exercise in futility by U.S. President Barack Obama. Legislation Republicans in the House of Representatives called Plan B did not reach enough votes and fell at the first hurdle. Plan B was a proposal led by House Speaker John Boehner aimed at combating the so-called fiscal cliff, the term used to describe the end-of-year deadline when a bundle of tax breaks and cuts is due to expire, automatically raising tax for most U.S. citizens. Boehner has spent the past few weeks locking horns with the president over the legislation, but also his own party, who refused to back his compromise plan. Democrats in the House called the legislation a waste of precious time. And we are engaged here in the House on this floor today in what has become a ridiculous political stunt, which will actually take us much closer as a country to go, going over uh, the fiscal cliff. Uh, we're wasting valuable time. The House did pass one bill aimed at cutting domestic spending while protecting the U.S. defense budget. But the major issue of contention centers around raising tax on the U.S.'s wealthy, a point on which Obama and Republicans refused to budge. Both sides agree, however, that if no compromise is reached in two weeks, it would hurt citizens across the board. Failure to address this debt crisis means not just 47 percent of Americans, but every American gets hurt if we don't fix this mess. The fiscal cliff looms. If the country's left to tumble over it, analysts warn it could push the US economy back into recession. All right, Will, how have markets been reacting to all this? Well, I'll give you three guesses. No, it wasn't good, and it isn't good at the moment in Europe, uh, the way things are opening up. As you can imagine, all the major indices are currently trading down uh, off the back of that news of another, well, setback on the road to a fiscal cliff agreement. You can see the European markets there. And actually, in Asia, where things are closed now, it's been even worse, if anything. Uh, the Nikkei, uh, which had been above the 10,000 mark for the last couple of days, so the first time since April, has dropped back below it, down almost a percentage point. Uh, and the other markets in a similar shape as well. OK, and markets here in France, uh, meanwhile, are unlikely to be cheered uh, by disappointing growth forecasts. Yes, and so the uh, official forecasting body has uh, been putting out its predictions for, well, the whole of 2012, uh, how it will look, and also the next couple of quarters. And for the whole of 2012, it's going to be 0.1% growth. They reckon the government spending plans are based on 0.3% growth. So that's going to put them out of joint quite a bit. And the next couple of quarters aren't going to be getting any better 0.1% uh, growth there too. And actually, for the last quarter of 2012, we're expected to dip slightly into negative growth. Uh, now, uh, Francois Hollande has been talking this morning on the radio. He's been saying uh, that he's still positive that growth will return next year and that jobs will start to return next year. He's hoping to get unemployment back down by the end of 2013, he says. Uh, it's still growing at the moment, expected to break through the 10% barrier. Uh, he's also saying he's hoping to keep the deficit to 3% of GDP despite the worsening figures. Well, of course, uh, one hope to get the French economy back on track is to make workers more flexible, but that's not proving too easy. No, there's been a lot of talk on this, uh, maybe uh, more heat than light at the moment. Employers, unions and uh, bosses are in talks. They have been holding talks over the last couple of days. Very little agreement as yet. Of course, the idea being to make employees more flexible, uh, easier to hire and fire, and within jobs to make it easier to put employees on different projects. Uh, the idea is that this will make firms more competitive. Now, this sort of thing has already been tried in Finland. Let's take a look at what happens there and what lessons France could perhaps learn. In the middle of the Finnish countryside for the past three and a half centuries, this factory has fabricated metal objects, scissors and garden tools that are exported all around the world. At first glance, the technique looks archaic. The metal is heated to 1,200 degrees and pressed. But the business is competitive because of these robots, which are everywhere. 
When a machine spits out a blade, a worker attaches it to the arm. It's more efficient when there's one operator operating the whole cell. The operator is, is uh, feeding the machine with components that are necessary for the product. Limiting the number of workers at the factory is crucial. In Finland, the cost of employing staff is among the highest in the world. Employees here earn on average 2,200 euros per month. In exchange, the boss has greater flexibility. They can work on different product lines. That's one, one way of flexibility. The other flexibility of the form is that, that we have, let's say, very high seasonal demand on certain products. The number of employees is altered depending on the product demand. Bosses here are about to remove 90 posts and will pick up 60 temporary workers in spring. Staff and unions are used to this type of management. It's easy to find work in a country where unemployment is at 7%. We understand that it's important to constantly improve the production process. Also boosting competitivity is innovation. In Finland, businesses invest more than any other European country in research and development. All right, well, let's get some technology news now. And, uh, Will, it's uh, still uh, bad news for BlackBerry. I'm afraid so, yeah. For the first time, their subscriber base has actually gone into decline in the last quarter. Uh, from 80 million active users to 79 million. Doesn't sound like very much of a drop, I suppose. But on the other hand, uh, what with Africa and Asia, those markets really expanding at the moment, and other platforms adding millions of users every quarter, it's, uh, well, worrying that BlackBerry can't even stand still. Uh, also, it's seen its profits drop to nine $9 million for the most recent quarter compared to $265 million for the quarter, the same quarter a year previously. It is hoping, pinning its hopes really, on the, its new operating system, BlackBerry 10. That'll come out in January, along with new handsets. Uh, they'll be hoping that that will save the platform. All right, well, we'll have to wait and see. Meanwhile, uh, Facebook could be planning to charge people to send messages. Now, don't worry, Hannah, <laughs> don't worry. It's not quite as bad as it sounds, but this is a limited trial uh, taking place in the United States. It's for people who want to send messages to people they're not already friends with on Facebook. So if you don't know somebody, then the idea is you might have to pay a dollar. It's being tried out at the moment. Uh, Facebook is selling it as a way to cut down on spam, because obviously if you have to pay to send a message, you're not just going to send out thousands of messages, regardless of uh, the content and who exactly they're to. Uh, so it could help. Obviously, it'll also help Facebook's bottom line if it is introduced across the board. Uh, but uh, yeah, I should repeat, it's, it's only a very small experiment and it's not intended uh, for people you are already friends with on Facebook. OK, good news. Well, uh, why has France failed in its latest bid to get a foothold on English soil? Well, the port of Dover, it was set to be privatised. Now, uh, of course, uh, any Englishman watching will know that uh, the White Cliffs of Dover are a symbolic uh, part of the UK. The leading bidder was apparently, reportedly, it was the uh, local authority of Calais, of course, the port on the other side of the channel. Uh, but the, now the British government has decided to cancel plans to sell the port. Uh, that's due mainly to local opposition. Uh, they were hoping to raise around 350 million euros from the sale, uh, but uh, that's now not going to go ahead. And the local MP said it was the best Christmas present the town could have hoped for. Apparently, lucky him, <laughs> lucky him. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed. That wraps up uh, this update for now from us here at France Van Cat. More news coming up very shortly. Bye-bye.